Hello. What's that? Barely. So far, so good. Barely. No, I <laughs> So, is everyone ready to blast through the last of Antibiotics 101? Yep. So, we've made it actually fairly far, as you can see. So, um, we're in the home stretch. Um, so, to continue with the gram positive agents, does anyone want me to review the resistance slides that we kind of went through at the end of yesterday, or is everyone okay? Raise your hand if you want me to review these. Okay, why not? We have time, I think. So, um, so and again, the, these drugs that we're going to go through would be, for now, the glycopeptides and the lipoglycopeptides, vancomycin being the only glycopeptide, the other three being lipoglycopeptides, and so derivatives of vancomycin, again, we have our two agents that were approved just in, in 2014. So again, as a reminder, the way vancomycin and the other drugs work is to inhibit cell wall synthesis, albeit at a different site than do the beta-lactams. And so again, vancomycin and these other drugs bind to this diala, diala terminus at the end of peptidoglycan precursors. And so we inhibit cell wall synthesis much in the same way as the beta-lactams do, and you have cell death, and so these end up being sidal drugs. A reminder, though, that if you compare vancomycin to beta-lactams, vancomycin is a less efficient killer, and so it's more weakly sidal and it's more slowly sidal as well. Um, so again, there are some scenarios, for instance, staphylococcal osteomyelitis, where really a penicillin is a much better drug for that condition than is vancomycin because it has much more efficient killing by the beta-lactam. So again, from a resistance point of view, we have resistance in enterococci compared with resistance in staphylococci. So resistance in enterococci is that target site modification, so the d ala d -ala terminus becomes a d ala d lac terminus, and vancomycin can't bind to that d ala d lac terminus, and so you basically have a lack of inhibition of cell wall synthesis, and so you have resistance to vancomycin. And so, BRE uh, has been around since really the, the 90s, I would say, um, a fairly important pathogen. Thankfully, it's a pathogen that, um, on the grand scale of things, doesn't cause very severe illnesses, unlike staph. And so while BRE is fairly common, especially in hospitalized patients, it doesn't tend to cause extremely serious disease, especially when you consider comparing it to staphylococci. Then you have staphylococci, and so again, we always feared that could enterococci transfer resistance to staphylococci, and when we had the first reports of resistance, um, which were really not full resistance, but rather intermediate resistance, we found that this was not acquired from enterococci, it just kind of developed de novo, basically, in staphylococci. And so again, you have this thickened cell wall that's produced and so you have a lack of penetration of vancomycin to where it needs to act. And so this is referred to vancomycin intermediate susceptible staph aureus, uh, so visa or GISA. I may have said this in pharmacology, but there's, um, I think, sort of an urban legend that I don't know if it's true or not, that the visa credit card company got upset when this resistant pathogen was called visa, and so they objected to it being called visa. I really don't know if that's truly a true story, but anyway. So GISA would, be, would stand for glycopeptide intermediate staph aureus. So then finally in 2002, we had what we always feared, again, so enterococci transferred that target site modification-based resistance to staphylococci, and so we had the first reports of full-blown resistant staph aureus with resistance to, um, to vancomycin. So again, same mechanism, the d ala d ala terminus becomes a d ala d lac terminus, and you have lack of binding of the drug to the target site. Again, um, a bad organism, uh, very high MICs to vancomycin, and an organism that you can't treat with vancomycin. Uh, many of the patients who um, were found to have VRSA, did not survive their infections. So certainly uh, a worrisome pathogen, but again, as I said yesterday, the only consolation, I think, is that we've had rel relatively few cases of this so far. And so for whatever reason, we don't really know the reasons for this, it hasn't emerged and become the epidemic problem that we had feared. So from a pharmacokinetics point of view, um, so really vancomycin, while it is available as an oral agent, that oral agent has essentially 0% absorption, so um, no systemic concentrations would be acquired. 
after you do a course of oral vancomycin. And so where do we use oral vancomycin? We use oral vancomycin as one of the drugs of choice to treat C. difficile infection because C. difficile being an infection of the GI tract, you basically take advantage of the fact that you have just those local concentrations of vancomycin within the GI tract because you have a lack of absorption. And so vancomycin, one of the top uh, first-line agents to treat C. diff infections. Um, if someone has any other infection, so any systemic infection, and you give that patient oral vancomycin, you may as well be giving them placebo because you get no systemic absorption whatsoever with oral vancomycin. Um, as far as distribution, um, fairly wide distribution, um, sort of poor CNS penetration. So vancomycin, in addition to being a slowly and weakly bactericidal agent from a killing point of view, also has sort of lousy pharmacokinetics and, for instance, doesn't get very good CNS penetration. We do use vancomycin in meningitis, um, always in combination with other agents as well because of that poor penetration. And so, really, when I was in school, my instructor described vancomycin as the so-called Cadillac of gram-positive agents is what he called it. And you can think of it that way if you want, but it's really based only on the organisms that it covers. So it has a very good coverage of gram-positive agents, and there are a few gram positives that are resistant, but that's really the only advantage that vancomycin has. Its killing is kind of lousy, its kinetics are sort of lousy. We'll talk about some toxicities of it as well. So still a very useful drug and a drug that you'll see quite a bit, but um, sort of an inefficient drug compared to some other agents. Um, from a metabolism point of view, so a renally eliminated drug, um, another drug like aminoglycosides where we have to be careful with patients who have impaired renal function and we have to adjust our dosing um, based on that renal function. Um, this, another drug, like the aminoglycosides that, as we'll see in a second, causes nephrotoxicity. This is another drug where we also do therapeutic drug monitoring to help us with not only efficacy, but also with safety, and so uh, measuring vancomycin concentrations to watch out for that vancomycin-induced nephrotoxicity. So again, spectrum of activity, very good gram-positive coverage, certainly. So MSSA, MRSA, strep, enterococcus, carinibacterium, you name it from a gram-positive point of view, and vancomycin is usually going to cover it, and usually you're not going to have much in the way of resistance. So certainly very good, reliable gram-positive coverage. From a gram-negative point of view, just think of it as being absolutely none whatsoever. So again, these are the sort of... Um, sort of fake grouping that I've created called gram-positive agents. So you would not use vancomycin for a gram-negative infection at all. And then finally, from an anaerobe point of view, um, so it does have activity against C. diff, and as you'll learn, vancomycin still is one of the preferred agents to treat C. diff infections. So adverse effects. I mentioned nephrotoxicity. Um, like the aminoglycosides, this nephrotoxicity is usually reversible. <laughs> Um, you see there the rates um, at which that occurs when you have patients receiving only vancomycin, so relatively low incidence. Um, that incidence can be made lower if we're careful and we do therapeutic drug monitoring, if we monitor patients, creatinine, et cetera, and adjust doses accordingly. However, as you see, the incidence jumps when you combine vancomycin with aminoglycosides, and as I said, often in empiric regimens, that's a very traditional combination that you would see used, is the combination of vancomycin and, and, and I mean, like aside, so certainly something to be careful about when it comes to um, monitoring renal function, watching out for toxicities. Um, vancomycin is fairly famous for causing so-called redneck syndrome or red man syndrome, um, which is an infusion-related reaction, usually due to infusing the drug over too rapid a period of time. And so it's said that we should um, administer each dose of vancomycin, for instance, as an IV infusion over at least an hour. If you do it more rapidly, you're going to pretty consistently cause this uh, allergic reaction. So we'll talk about that reaction in a second here in, in the next slides. Um, hematologically, can cause some penias, so some neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, um, typically reversible, also typically associated with long-term um, high-dose therapy, not like a seven-day course of vancomycin per se. So a little bit more about um, redneck or red man syndrome. So um, an infusion-related reaction, very important that this is not a vancomycin allergy. And so patients will often get mislabeled as being vancomycin allergic because they have this reaction. And so it's not an allergic reaction whatsoever. Um, this used to be more common. Um, vancomycin used to be a very impure product. It was called Mississippi mud because of the 
the appearance of the product. We now have better, uh, purer products of vancomycin that are available commercially that have less of a risk of this reaction. Uh, the mechanism is not fully understood, but it's thought to be uh, related to mast cells and basophils and histamine release, basically. That histamine release is dependent upon the amount and, importantly, the rate of exposure to vancomycin. So again, you want to be careful with your infusion rates. So how does this manifest? Certainly puritis, uh, erythematous rash, as you see on the upper torso, face, and neck, dizziness, headache. Um, in severe cases, you can have things like hypotension, angioedema, chest pain, and dyspnea. Not very common that you would see those more severe manifestations. Um, re resolves when you slow down the infusion, so a reversible set of symptoms, but just something to be careful about, and again, importantly, that you don't label patients as being vancomycin allergic. A little bit more about this, so onset um, typically occurs fairly quickly within the infusion period, so within the first 15 minutes of the infusion. Sometimes can occur later on after the dose has been given, but more likely to be something that occurs while the patient's receiving the drug. Um, resolve spontaneously again. Um, patients will develop a tolerance to this, so after a few doses they'll start seeing this uh, less and less. Um, risk factors that you see there again, rapid infusion is a big important one, so not infusing vancomycin doses over say 30 minutes because you're really increasing the odds of that happening. If it's a person's first exposure to vancomycin and they haven't had the ability to develop any kind of tolerance, that's another risk factor as well. Um, younger patients as well. And then any other drugs that a patient might be receiving at the same time that also stimulate histamine release. So amphotericin B, you got any fungal being another one, or fampin, opioids as well. So um, you want to be careful with patients uh, taking those meds as well. Drug-drug interactions. Uh, so like the aminoglycosides, really the major one would be concurrent nephrotoxins, basically. And so having that additive nephrotoxicity. So we talked about aminoglycosides. Amphotericin B, uh, an antifungal, um, kind of colloquially referred to as amphoterrible because it's so bad on your kidneys, and so um, combinations of vancomycin and amphotericin are problematic, cyclosporin and NSAIDs really. So many of the same drugs that we talked about when we talked about aminoglycosides and just having that additive damage to the kidneys. So any questions about vancomycin? All right, so I have just one slide each on each of these newer um, vancomycin-like drugs, basically. So Televancin uh, was the first one, um, approved in 2009. Uh, similar mechanism of action, however, it also has the added ability to depolarize the cell membranes, and so causes, um, basically, punches holes in, in the cell membrane through that reaction. Um, as far as its approvals, it's approved for CSSSI, which is complicated skin and skin structure infections. Also um, approved for HAP, or hospital-acquired pneumonia, and VAP, which is ventilator-associated pneumonia. Um, we'll see with the next two agents, they also are approved for skin and skin structure infections. Skin and skin structure infections are sort of an easy target for a drug company from the standpoint of getting an FDA-approved indication. Um, they're fairly easy to find patients to recruit into trials that have skin infections. It's also a fairly lucrative indication to get because skin infections are fairly common. And so, you know, if you're a drug company and you're trying to decide how to strategically market your drug, if you can get an indication like complicated skin and skin structure infections, which is fairly common, then that's going to add to the profitability of your drug. Whereas endocarditis, for instance, is nowhere near as common a condition, and so you wouldn't really have the widespread use of your drug. So as you'll see, these next few drugs all have that indication of skin and skin structure infections. So comparing it to vancomycin, one of the big knocks on this drug is that it has been shown to pose a greater risk of nephrotoxicity when compared to vancomycin. Also has a higher rates of GI side effects. Also has this interesting uh, dysgeusia, which is, anyone know what that means? Yeah, so bad taste or taste disturbances. Um, also has been shown to have some teratogenicity in animal models, and so is pregnancy category C. Interestingly enough, vancomycin is also pregnancy category C, but the wording in the package insert for televancin is much more um, strict when it comes to uh, warning against the use in pregnant patients and doing pregnancy tests, for instance, before starting this drug. And so um, has been shown to have more teratogenicity than um, vancomycin. Also, this drug can cause prolongation of the QTC interval. Um, vancomycin really does not do that. 
Um, like vancomycin has the risk of additive nephrotoxicity and probably based on the studies that we've seen has even more of that risk of additive nephrotoxicity when compared to vancomycin. So does it sound like a very um, useful or desirable drug to have on the market? So basically this is vancomycin but with worse nephrotoxicity in my opinion. So um, as, a, as, as you might expect, this drug's been around since 2009. I have never seen this drug used, not a drug that you're gonna probably ever see very commonly used, if ever, potentially. Next we have uh, aridavancin. So um, this drug has, again, the same mechanism of action as vancomycin, but then adds on um, two other um, related uh, mechanisms of action. So it also breaks up the integrity of the cell membrane by depolarizing the cell membrane. And it also basically works at the same place where the beta-lactams would work. So it would bind to penicillin binding proteins. So it's almost like a combination of vancomycin and a beta-lactam, essentially, from a mechanism point of view. Approved only for the treatment of skin and soft tissue infections. Um, adverse effects are much less common than they are for vancomycin, uh, less nephrotoxicity than vancomycin, we think. There haven't been a ton of studies yet published on this drug. Um, has been shown to cause C. diff more so than televancin or or vancomycin. From a drug interaction point of view, increases serum concentrations of warfarin. That's about the only really significant drug-drug interaction. So really the, the, the neat thing, I suppose, about oritavancin is if you look at that half-life, so a 245-hour half-life, which is just ridiculously long. And so this is a single-dose therapy. You give one single infusion and you're done with your course of therapy, basically. So that's really why this drug was brought to market to be a, an easier um, way to basically give vancomycin, if you will, on an outpatient basis. And so vancomycin, and we didn't really talk about the dosing of vancomycin from an IV point of view, but you're going to be seeing, depending on renal function, either Q24, Q12 hour IV dosing, maybe Q8 in some, state, in some instances. For um, most indications with vancomycin IV, you're going to be looking at 7 day, 10 day, 14 days of therapy. So that becomes challenging on an outpatient basis because how are you going to deal with managing outpatient IV infusions? You can do so, but it's hard to do. So this kind of solves that problem where you give your one dose and you're essentially done. So, so that's really what the, the niche of this drug is. And then finally, Dalvavancin. So these are sort of in order of approval. So Aridavancin and Dalvavancin were both approved in 2014. Dalvavancin lacks those extra uh, mechanisms of action, so it really only works the same way as vancomycin does. Also approved for uh, treatment of skin and soft tissue infections. You see the adverse effects there are fairly mild. Um, can also cause red man or red neck syndrome. Um, interestingly, there's been no major drug-drug interactions identified as of yet. Um, you know, who knows, this is a new drug, so as we have more and more clinical experience, we'll probably start seeing something when it comes to more adverse effects and more drug interactions, but for now, there's really not an awful lot um, to dislike about this drug from that point of view. Another drug with a, a long half-life, so you see this, um, not a single-dose therapy, but it's a two-dose therapy. So a single gram dose IV followed a week later by a 500 milligram dose, and then you're done, basically. So interestingly enough, with um, with the ongoing lack of drug development that especially big pharma companies are, are undertaking nowadays, which we'll talk more about tomorrow, um, organizations like the IDSA and other advocacy organizations have been pushing for the government to help companies and to basically stimulate the production of new antibiotics. And so one measure that came through the IDSA and other groups' advocacy was something called the GAIN Act. Have you learned about the GAIN Act anywhere? So the GAIN Act is basically a stimulus program to encourage companies to develop new antibiotics. And so some of the things that the GAIN Act does is it um, fast tracks the approval of drugs that are deemed to be worthy, so they, have, they spend less time basically before they get approved. Another thing that's added is that um, you, you add five years of patent exclusivity to the drugs that are approved through the GAIN Act, so you're giving the company more time before their drug becomes generic. So the GAIN Act was thought to be a really positive thing as far as encouraging companies to develop uh, new antibiotics, Dalvavancin happened to be the first drug that was approved through that, or as a result of the GAIN Act. And so there actually has been some um, criticism of the GAIN Act because people have said basically we have this great new incentive program to 
develop new antibiotics, and we, get, we basically get a new version of vancomycin that has better kinetics and gets dosed twice, and that's what the end result of this program was. And so, you know, unfortunately, when it comes to antibiotic development nowadays, you see a lot of these so-called Me Too drugs, and so this really doesn't offer a new mechanism of action, doesn't offer a new spectrum of activity, it just offers really dosing convenience. So sort of a disappointment from that point of view. Although, again, it's always nice to at least see some drug development in ID because we don't see a lot of it anymore. <coughs> so questions about that group of drugs. So next we have the oxazolidinones, uh, so linazolid or Zyvox, available both in IV and PO forms, and then tadezolid or Sevextro, uh, also available in IV and PO forms. Another drug that was just recently approved over the summer in 2014 when we had this sort of wave of new drugs coming out on the market. So um, this slide is labeled linazolid characteristics, but really it, it applies to both drugs. And so another drug that inhibits protein synthesis, but does so at a unique uh, place in that <coughs> protein synthesis portion. And so it basically inhibits um, the, the formation of the 23, or acts at the 23S ribosomal RNA of the 50S ribosomal subunit. So it acts at a subset of that 50S subunit. And so, again, the end result of that, like the macrolides, tetracyclines, clindamycin, is inhibition of protein synthesis um, and, and um, inhibition or inhibition of growth. So these are also static agents for most <laughs> organisms, like the macrolides, etc. From a resistance mechanism, uh, there are modifications to the 23S ribosome that have been reported. Uh, thankfully, linazolid resistance has been fairly uncommon, although it does occur. Um, linazolid is a completely synthetic antibiotic, and so when it was approved, and it's also the first of its class of drugs, and so when it was first released, there was some thought that maybe we would finally have a drug to which bacteria could not become resistant because being synthetic, bacteria in the environment had never seen this drug before, so maybe they wouldn't develop resistance. I think we're all kind of silly to think that because, of course, we do see resistance, thankfully, at this point, fairly infrequently. Again, static, as I mentioned, also a time-dependent killing agent. Absorption, so this is sort of a famous drug uh, because it's 100% bioavailable. Um, so there's no difference whatsoever between using IV and oral therapy as long as a patient can safely take oral therapy and can, and can absorb oral therapy. So um, a very, I don't think there's any other antibiotics that I can think of that have 100% bioavailability. Um, distribution is fairly wide, gets fairly good CNS penetration, and so we do sometimes use linazolid as sort of a second-line drug for meningitis, especially caused by things like MRSA and other resistant pathogens. Um, from a metabolism and excretion point of view, nothing really exciting here. Um, so both hepatic and renal excretion as well. So spectrum of activity, I guess you could maybe call this the Rolls-Royce of gram-positive agents compared to vancomycin being the Cadillac, I don't know. Uh, so definitely also covers MSSA, MRSA, strep, enterococci. You see there that this would have activity against vancomycin resistant strains of enterococci, so even a little bit better coverage against gram-positives than vancomycin. Also covers crinibacterium, another drug where really has virtually no gram-negative activity, and really in your heads think of it as no activity against gram-negatives, that'd be the easier way to think about this. Also no anaerobic activity. Um, from a niche organism point of view, this drug does have some activity against mycobacteria, and so in recent years there's been some use of linazolid to treat mycobacterium tuberculosis as sort of a second and third line agent, especially with resistant TB that's resistant to our first line agents. So from an adverse effect point of view, a few notable ones. Um, first would be myelosuppression, and the most important of these would be thrombocytopenia. And so about 5 to 6% of cases of patients who receive this drug will have some form of thrombocytopenia. Uh, more rarely, you'll see neutropenia. So the usual manifestation of this would be thrombocytopenia. Um, reversible, importantly, and so that's a, a good thing about this. And from the standpoint of the incidence of thromb thrombocytopenia, um, much more of a risk in patients who have prolonged therapy, which has been shown to be anything more than two weeks of therapy. So if you're within that window of two weeks of therapy, you still would be careful about doing some 
monitoring of platelet counts, but it's going to be much less of a concern versus someone who's on prolonged courses of therapy. And we do sometimes use prolonged courses of therapy of linezolib. A second important one would be optic neuropathy, and so patients have actually experienced blindness due to being on linazolid. Um, extremely rare, fortunately, and also associated with even long-term use. So over four weeks of linazolid therapy is when you would start to think about the concern about optic neuropathy, and we don't tend to use four weeks of linazolid for most indications, really, thankfully. And then also peripheral neuropathy, again, associated with long-term use, uh, over four weeks of therapy, which again, clinically speaking, you won't see um, very often. From a drug interactions point of view, so linazolid has a, has a fairly significant interaction as far as causing serotonin syndrome, which you learned about over the last couple of weeks, I guess, right? So, so linazolid is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, and so if you use it in combination with um, other monoamine oxidase inhibitors, you can have that potential for serotonin syndrome. Also, if patients are eating tyramine-rich foods, and so all of those sort of weird aged, fermented, and pickled foods, and Chianti, and things like that. Um, but it's more important, really, from a, the standpoint of concomitant drug interactions. And so the most important of these would be concomitant use of antidepressants. And so the question is, what do you do um, with someone who is on an antidepressant? Um, you want to give them a course of linazolid. How do you manage that? Um, that type of interaction. Anyone have any thoughts? And so you have a patient who's on paroxetine. They've been on paroxetine for a long time. You want to give them linazolid. What do you think you would do? You could not use linazolid, I guess, right? That would be an easy way. But what if you have to use linazolid? So you could DC the paroxetine, right? Would that help the problem, do you think? Because you need to have the washout period of, of paroxetine, right? So that's not going to really do you any good. Um, any other thoughts? I guess really those would be the only two things that I can really think of. And so what most clinicians, um, so there really isn't an easy answer to how to handle that drug interaction. What most clinicians say is that if the person's going to be an inpatient uh, receiving linazolid, you would just give linazolid and just watch for signs and symptoms of serotonin syndrome and you'd just be, be cautious. It becomes more concerning where would you want to send someone home on the combination of linazolid and Paxil or something like that? Probably not. And so that's a case where really the best, most prudent thing to do would be to use something other than linazolid if you can. Um, or, so again, really just inpatient monitoring, outpatient use, probably try to find something else. And usually you probably could find an alternative to linazid if you, if you had to do so. Does that make sense? So then just briefly about um, tadezolid. So really this is pretty much another, you know, a me too version of linazolid, um, also approved for the treatment of skin and soft tissue infections. Um, two big do two big things about this would be that um, thought to pose lower risk of uh, thrombocytopenia and other um, types of um, um, suppression of your, your blood cells, basically. Um, also does cause that peripheral neuropathy and optic neuropathy, but also very rare and also associated with longer courses of therapy. Um, it's thought to be a lower risk as far as the, the risk of serotonin syndrome. Um, however, one limitation to, um, to predicting this is that in the clinical trials that were used to support the approval of this drug, if a patient was receiving another medication that would pose a risk for um, serotonin syndrome, they were excluded from the clinical trials. And so we really don't know exactly yet what's going to happen when it comes to the risk of this drug and drug interactions in patients receiving things like antidepressants. Um, bioavailability, not quite as good as linazolid, but still very good bioavailability. So this really is, um, you know, a perhaps safer version of linazolid and doesn't really offer much in the way of benefits other than that. Um, this drug was, um, was, was brought to market by Cubist, which is a company down um, in the Boston area, which is a small biotech company that's been one of the more... Um, engaged companies when it comes to developing new antibiotics. They also tend to be, or happen to be, 
a very pharmacist friendly drug company and so there are many people who've kind of trained in, in ID during my era of training who have positions with Cubist including high level positions in the company. Um, we were also um, trying to develop appy rotations with this company interestingly which I think would have been a cool opportunity. Um, does anyone know what happened to Cubist in December? Yes. Right, so they got bought out by Merck, and so our appies went up in smoke. Um, I don't know what's happening to all the different pharmacists who work for this company, but I think from what I've heard, they're all sort of nervous about what may happen. And so I think um, it was sort of bittersweet when that happened because a lot of us in ID pharmacy kind of held Cubist as being like this really, you know, company on the forefront that was spending a lot of time and money developing antibiotics. And in the end, they became a victim of their own success, and Big Pharma swooped in and, and bought them. So probably the owners of Cubist are, are very happy and doing very well, I assume. Um, but you know, it was a little bit bittersweet that this small underdog company got swallowed up by Big Pharma. So anyway, that's my Big Pharma rant. <laughs> so any questions about oxazolidones? Um, I guess another, um, before I go on, another adverse effect, if you will, of linazolid. Anyone have any idea of how costly linazolid is? So it's super expensive, so thousands of dollars for a course of linazolid. And so not an adverse effect per se, but a limitation to the use of linazolid. And tenazolid um, really is in the same boat as well, so expensive drugs to use. So next we have the lipopeptides. There's only one of these, so daptomycin or cubicin, um, as you might guess based on the name, also developed by Cubist, and this actually was the first drug that Cubist brought to market. So an IV-only agent. So how does this drug work? Um, it binds to the cell membrane, um, causes depolarization of the cell membrane, which then leads to disruption of the cell membrane, formation of pores in the cell membrane, so leakage of cell contents and basically lysis of cell membranes. And so as you would expect based on that description of that mechanism of action, this would be a sidle agent certainly. From a resistance point of view, um, has been very rare so far. There's thought to be um, some role in an increase in the positive charge of the cell membrane and daptomycin is repelled by positive charges and so the cell membrane becomes more positively charged and so kind of daptomycin sort of bounces off of the cell membrane essentially. Um, daptomycin is a relatively new drug, and so we haven't really seen much in the way of resistance now yet, really just more like scattered case reports of resistance. Um, so bactericidal, also concentration-dependent killing. Um, poor absorption, so not available as an oral agent from a distribution. Um, very, very high protein binding, so over 90% of this drug will be bound to plasma proteins, and so the free fraction of drug, which is what exerts its antibacterial activity, is very low. So unfortunately, one of the downsides of this drug is its high protein binding. We like to use drugs that have low protein binding, so we have more free drug available to work. Um, really, no CNS penetration, poor bone <coughs> penetration, so a fairly low distribution. Um, one of the important things about um, daptomycin to remember is that it does get good um, penetration into the lungs, but it is inactivated and bound to by surfactants in your lung. And so for that reason, daptomycin is absolutely not a go when it comes to treating pneumonia. And so it gets into the lungs, but then it gets bound up by those surfactants, and so you have ineffective therapy of pneumonia. Um, from a metabolism and excretion point of view, primarily renally excreted as unchanged drug, a half-life of about eight hours, so nothing too interesting there. Spectrum of activity, uh, sort of like linazolid, I guess. So um, all gram positives, basically, you name it from a gram positive point of view, again, daptomycin is going to cover it, so MSSA, MRSA, VRE as well. So one of the niches of daptomycin and linazolid, and I suppose tenazolid, would be use for vancomycin-resistant organisms, because these drugs would retain activity against vancomycin-resistant organisms. Like linazolid, no gram negative, and no anaerobic coverage also. So this drug was approved for skin and soft tissue infections, um, Staph aureus bacteremia, and then also right-sided endocarditis caused by Staph aureus. So a relatively limited um, number of approvals. Um, I forgot to, to, to point out, so those, all those new drugs like Dalavancin, Telavancin, Tedezolid, um, as I said, they all have approval for skin and soft tissue infections. 
Another reason why the, there was criticism of the role of the GAIN Act in leading to the development of Dalbovancin was that we have lots and lots of drugs that are useful for skin and soft tissue infections caused by gram-positive agents. And so, again, did we really need the GAIN Act to give us yet another drug against an infection that we have plenty of options for already? Um, adverse effects. So nothing, uh, there are not a lot of adverse effects, but there's one um, major notable one, and that would be myopathy. And so you, you'll see elevated creatinine or creatine phosphokinase levels. Um, this is a dose-dependent effect, and it's a reversible adverse effect as well. And so adaptomycin, just a brief history, was a drug that was being developed by Eli Lilly back in the 60s and 70s. Um, however, Lilly noticed that a lot of patients were having this myopathy, having muscle soreness, et cetera. So Lilly basically abandoned the drug. And then Cubist was a new company looking for drugs that they could perhaps poach from other companies or drugs that had been sort of abandoned. And so they did the studies to show that that toxicity was a dose-dependent effect. And so they did the requisite studies to show that there was a safe dose that you could use that still was an effective dose for infections. And so that's really how this drug eventually came to market. And so clinically speaking, the recommendations are that you should monitor CPK levels weekly and that you should also be careful when you're using these drugs along with your statins <coughs> as well because you can have additive myopathy. Um, from a gastrointestinal point of view, can cause some GI side effects, but again, what antibiotic doesn't really. So myopathy is the big thing with this drug. So the question becomes, how do you manage this in patients who are receiving statins? And so um, there was kind of like the linazolid um, antidepressant combination. There were, for a long time, there was sort of a conflicting judgments about how to handle this. But currently, the manufacturer of um, daptomycin recommends basically that if you start daptomycin, it's okay to do but that you simply discontinue the statin and the person will not be on the statin drug for whatever period of time they're receiving daptomycin. You should still be a little bit more careful and maybe do more frequent monitoring of CPK levels, but the combination of the two is not contraindicated as long as you DC the, the, the statin drug, basically. So questions about daptomycin. Um, there's been some recent pushes to use more aggressive dosing of daptomycin, and we've seen, as a result of that, some more um, frequent um, myopathies, and so there's a little bit of concern that maybe since we're kind of back to pushing the dose of daptomycin that we might have more of this in the future, but time will tell. So a sample question. Which of the following poses the greatest risk of QTC prolongation? Thinking back, I may not have actually given you the answer to this question, but we'll, we'll see. So does anyone want to say vancomycin? So vancomycin, really not a drug that you worry about QTC prolongation with. So vancomycin would not be the answer. Anyone want to go for TMPSMX? Looks like not. Anyone want to go for Cipro? like some people. So quinolones definitely can cause QTC prolongation. Anyone want to go for erythromycin? So yeah, so erythromycin and the macrolides in general, really erythromycin primarily though, would be um, a little bit more serious concern when it comes to QC, QTC prolongation, which I think I did not mention yesterday. But when it comes to the, high, the kind of hierarchy of QTC prolongation, it would go macrolides, quinolones, etc. So anti-anaerobic agents. Um, so really we'll talk about two agents here. So metronidazole, flagyl, um, IV, PO, topical forms, and then tinidazole or tindamax, which has only an oral form. So how does metronidazole and tinidazole, for that matter, work? So this is a drug that's been around for decades, and yet we still don't know exactly how it works. It's thought to interact with bacterial DNA causing strand breakages within bacterial DNA, also destabilization of the DNA helix. And so in the end result, bacteria sort of lose their DNA and cannot survive. But I think it's interesting that, again, we have this decades-old drug that we still can't quite figure out uh, the mechanism by which it works. From a resistance point of view, um, there are a variety of different mechanisms, as you would expect, since we don't fully understand the mechanism of action. We also don't fully understand the mechanisms of resistance. 
And thankfully, um, despite the fact that this drug's been around and used for decades, resistance is fairly uncommon, thankfully. Um, a bactericidal drug, also concentration-dependent killing. From a kinetics, uh, so nearly 100% bioavailability, also rapid absorption, which is good. From a distribution there, you see extremely varied distribution, gets into a variety of different tissues and fluids, um, and has some good um, kinetics from that point of view. Also a drug that has fairly good CNS penetration, and so we often kind of compare and contrast clindamycin and metronidazole, and so whereas clindamycin was not a very good drug for meningitis and really not a drug that you should see used for meningitis, metronidazole does have good CNS penetration and does have a role in, in limited fashion in some uh, episodes of, metron of um, sorry, meningitis, um, primarily hepatic when it comes to metabolism and excretion. So the spectrum of activity, um, no gram positive, no gram negative, so fairly easy to remember. So this is a drug that we use only for its um, anaerobic activity, basically. So including coverage of, again, the most important true anaerobe, Bacteroides fragilis. Also, if you see a variety of other um, or anaerobes that this agent covers. Uh, so also, again, if you compare and contrast clindamycin with metronidazole, Remember that clindamycin has had some reduction in activity and some resistance in Bacteroides fragilis to clindamycin, whereas that's not really a concern with metronidazole. And really, I guess clindamycin could have been grouped in this um, grouping of anti-anaerobic drugs, but remember that clindamycin also has its, um, its gram-positive uh, role as well. So um, this is more strictly anaerobes. You see there that C. diff is on the list as well, and so as you'll learn later this semester, along with vancomycin, metronidazole is the other drug of choice when it comes to treating C. diff infections. Um, does have some other um, niche uses there you see. So for instance, Giardia, metronidazole is a drug of choice. Also Trichomonas vaginalis. So metronidazole is used for a variety of STDs, um, but really primarily a drug that we use for its activity against anaerobes, including true below the diaphragm anaerobes. Um, adverse effects are Fairly innocuous, I would say, in the, in the grand scheme of things. Um, gastrointestinal, certainly, so it can cause nausea, dyspepsia, metallic case, dry mouth. Um, what do you think? Would, do you think that this would be a drug that could possibly cause C. diff infection or not? How many would say yes? A few of you. So I think. Important to remember that there is no antibiotic that cannot cause C. diff. Even the therapies for C. diff can cause C. diff. And so um, certainly metronidazole is way, way down on the list of drugs that can cause C. diff as far as the risk and the frequency, but there have been reports of C. diff associated with metronidazole. However, much more commonly that you would see just more nonspecific GI side effects. Um, you can have some neurologic side effects, so headache, insomnia, seizures, really associated more with long-term and high-dose therapy, which we don't typically see when it comes to metronidazole. In fact, many of our treatment regimens with metronidazole are very short, even single-dose therapies for certain infections. So not really something that you'll be too worried about in most clinical uses of this drug. Um, peripheral neuropathy, again, with prolonged use, which we don't typically see with this drug. Um, this drug can also discolor the urine, a uh, deep red-brown color which just becomes a counseling point for patients uh, to watch out for that and not be alarmed when their urine changes color. From a drug interactions point of view, uh, there's a few um, SIP-related interactions, and so you can have both inhibition um, by metronidazole, so resulting in elevated concentrations of warfarin, so having an increased risk for bleeding, for instance, uh, for, so for phenytoin and lithium as well. And then you can have induction of metabolism by, or of metronidazole, so having lowered concentrations of metronidazole and possibly treatment failure. Um, the big one there would be rif rifampin, and as you'll learn, rifampin is the worst um, inducer of the cytochrome P450 enzymes, and so it can cause really dramatic reductions in a drug that is uh, metabolized by CYP enzymes. And then, um, as I'm sure any of you who work in a community setting know, you have to caution patients about the risk of drinking alcohol at the same time that you receive. Metronidazole also has this disulfiram-like reaction of flushing tachycardia, palpitations, nausea, and vomiting. Um, in rare 
more severe cases, you can have things like acute psychosis and confusion. And so patients should be uh, instructed to avoid alcohol for at least a couple of days after they finish their course of therapy of metronidazole. Um, interestingly, if you look at the actual evidence that supports that disulfiram-like reaction with metronidazole, it's very scarce, but still it's something that we should counsel patients uh, about. Questions? And really, tinidazole, basically everything applies to tinidazole. Tinidazole, tinidazole is a newer uh, kind of version of, of metronidazole that we don't use nearly as often, but does have some uses, especially in some STDs, as you'll learn. Am I going too quickly, or is this okay? Okay, so we just have a few uh, miscellaneous drugs, so I'll have just one slide per these uh, miscellaneous drugs, basically, and then we'll be nearing the end. So, chloramphenicol. Um, again, you're not going to ever see someone write for chloromycetin, um, but I had to find a, a brand name somewhere. So long ago, became a generic drug, basically. So chloramphenicol, IV and PO formulations. Um, notable things about chloramphenicol has an extremely broad spectrum of activities. So it covers gram positives, gram negatives, covers anaerobes, covers atypicals, which again, depending on your point of view and what you're using the drug for, can be a very good thing or a very bad thing, again, depending. Um, an older drug, the, the major reason why you would rarely see this drug used, especially in the US, is that it's because of toxicity concerns. And so this can cause um, two types of anemia. The first would be a reversible anemia, um, which does not um, pose a risk of mortality. But unfortunately, chloramphenicol can also cause fatal aplastic anemia. You see the incidence there overall. So one in 21,000 600 courses of therapy is the current thinking on the incidence of this fatal aplastic anemia. Unfortunately, there's no way to predict in whom this will happen. There is no therapy for it, and it's almost always fatal. And so I, I like to think of, if you use this drug, you're almost playing Russian roulette in some respects. So are you going to be one of those 1 in 20,000 plus people who gets fatal um, aplastic anemia? So hence, we really don't use this drug very much um, in the U.S., especially um, in many developing parts of the world because of cost concerns, because of availability. The World Health Organization actually considers this to be one of their priority drugs to use. So for instance, in Africa, where as I've mentioned a couple of times, there are certain parts of Africa where we have incredible epidemics of meningitis. And in those parts of the, of the world, we don't have necessarily access to things like perineral ceftriaxone, which you use often in meningitis. And so chloramphenicol is broadly used in places because of the fact that it's so inexpensive and widely available. And again, with the fact that that fatal aplastic anemia is very, very rare. Um, so as far as um, other niche uses of this, um, this is a drug that gets very, very good CNS penetration, and outstanding CNS penetration, actually. And so we do sometimes, even in developing nations, we would see this drug used in patients who have a penicillin allergy, who have meningitis caused by either streptococcus pneumoniae or Neisseria meningitidis. Um, other than that, there really aren't a terrible number of indications that you would see chloramphenicol used for. So a very limited use drug, other than, again, in certain developing nations because of availability and low cost. Next would be um, nitrofurantoin. So, um, Fairly good activity, again, against gram-positive and gram-negatives, not really against atypicals or anaerobes. Um, you see there are two formulations. So there's the, the macrocrystalline form, hence the name macrodantin. Uh, the macrocrystalline form is, uh, causes less nausea, which is the major reason to use that macrocrystalline form. Then we also have an extended release macrocrystalline form called macrobid, which I think is named appropriately. So BID dosing of that form of, of nitrofurantoin. Um, another uh, extremely old drug, so a decades old drug, and yet um, contrary to what happens with most of our antibiotics, we, we have seen resistance to nitrofurantoin. Again, there's no drug that we have not seen resistance to, but despite decades of use, the incidence of resistance to nitrofurantoin, nitrofurantoin is extremely low, and so for instance in E. coli, the overall rates of resistance right now would be less than 1%, basically. So extremely rare resistance, which is a positive thing. Um, an interesting thing about uh, nitrofurantoin is that patients who have reduced renal function have, don't re um, achieve adequate concentrations in the urine, and so you can't use this in patients who have 
creatinine clearance is less than 50 to 60 is the usual cutoff you'll see. And so where do we use this drug? Uh, really, this is a UTI drug, and that's the only reason that you'll ever really see this drug used. So a drug that we use often in patients who have, especially um, patients with acute uncomplicated cystitis. And so currently, according to the current IDSA guidelines, actually nitrofurantoin is one of the preferred drugs for treating uncomplicated cystitis and other similar UTIs. Next we have uh, phosphomycin, so another really UTI drug I would say for the most part. Um, you see the spectrum of activity again fairly broad against gram positives and gram negatives. Um, you see adverse reactions there, so while I say that all antibiotics cause GI side effects, this is one where it's a little bit higher as far as the incidence of GI side effects, especially diarrhea, so almost a tenth of patients will have um, diarrhea. Headache is also fairly common. Uh, from a resistance point of view, um, not terribly high, but we've seen some somewhat alarming increases in resistance over the past few years, so there's some concern about the long-term viability of this drug, basically. So, so when do we use this drug right now? So right now, um, the oral formulation is the only drug that we have in the U.S. If you want the IV drug, you have to get a special um, emergency request to get the IV drug. So as far as the oral drug, this is the only uh, approved single dose regimen for acute uncomplicated cystitis. So you take a single dose and you're done with your therapy for cystitis. And so that's the primary reason that we use this drug um, in the U.S. Um, and elsewhere, I would say, too. Um, however, one of the sort of emerging niches of this drug is that we've talked a little bit about things like CRE, right, so carbapenem-resistant enterobacteriaceae, so those are these isolates that they're ESBL producers, so extended spectrum beta lactamase producers. They then also <coughs> develop the ability to produce carbapenemases, and so all of your beta lactams are off uh, the charts as far as being able to be used. Remember that ESBLs also confer cross resistance to tetracyclines, aminoglycosides, fluoroquinolones, TMP, SMX. So these carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae, which again are those organisms in the, the outbreak that's been in the news recently with the, the endoscopes, is um, treatable really by colistin, tigacycline, and sometimes phosphomycin. And so one of the emerging uses of this drug might be for some of those multi-resistant gram-negative pathogens for things like not only UTIs, but bacteremias, pneumonias maybe. And that's the situation in which you would want to acquire this IV formulation of the drug, which again, right now, you can't get in the US, but you can get um, in an emergency situation through places like the CDC. Tigacycline, um, so this is a glycyl cycline, so it's a tetracycline derivative. Um, extremely broad spectrum activity, so a lot of gram-positive coverage, a lot of gram-negative coverage. Um, one of our drugs that's active against MRSA, also active against MSSA, uh, also active against atypicals, um, also active against anaerobes. So really, Pseudomonas is one of the only holes in the coverage of this drug. Um, Importantly, this drug has an extremely high volume of distribution, and so it goes basically to all sorts of tissues and gets very good concentrations in those tissues. However, one of the, the unfortunate, um, I guess, side effects, if you will, of that is that you get extremely low serum and blood concentrations. And so this, this drug basically goes everywhere other than the blood, so it goes to your lungs, your bone, etc. So as a result of that, um, unfortunately, um, there have been some retrospective trials showing that if you compare tigacycline to comparators, especially in infections in which bacteremia is a possible component of that infection, and so you have these extremely low levels of tigacycline, the result of some of those trials has been that tigacycline was associated with higher rates of death compared to the comparator agents. And so about the worst kind of black box warning I think you would want is that your drug might cause more death than comparators, basically. And this drug now has that very black box warning, basically, showing that there's an increased risk of mortality, again, especially in infections where bacteremia is a concern. Um, so really, this is a drug that uh, I think, other than the fact that it retains activity against things like CRE, where you have very few options, I think if it wasn't for that, this drug probably would be dead, but unfortunately it does become a drug of last resort for patients who have some of these really terribly resistant uh, gram-negative infections where you essentially have very few options, and so tigacycline might be useful in some of those situations. <clears throat> 
And then the polymyxins. So we currently have two polymyxins, uh, polymyxin E, also known as colistin, polymyxin B as well. These are cationic detergents, and so they basically disrupt, uh, again, the cell membrane, cause holes in the cell membrane, act as detergents. Um, I've done some work with polymyxins in, in my lab, and if you make up a solution of a polymyxin and you shake it up, it foams up like it's a detergent, basically, which maybe will help you to remember that. Um, these are really old drugs that were first used in the 50s. Um, then they were abandoned, however, because there was a lot of both nephrotoxicity and neurotoxicity, especially seizures with these drugs. And so for a long time, these drugs were basically abandoned, um, other than that a lot of our, our topical antibiotic creams will have polymyxins. But from a systemic point of view, these drugs essentially were extinct. However, then over the last you know, 10 to 15 years, we have more and more of these gram negatives that are resistant to other drugs. And so right now, the polymyxins are having a real resurgence because they tend to have activity against things like CRE and some of these other hard to treat gram negative organisms, probably because we didn't use them for decades. And so we didn't really have any exposure of bacteria to these drugs. And so right now, these are being increasingly used, uh, again, for those multi-drug resistant gram negatives for which you have few other options. Uh, unfortunately, these drugs were approved during the time when you didn't have to do quite as much safety testing and PK testing to get approval of a drug. If you look at the package inserts for these drugs, they are pathetic with the lack of information that they have. And so there's a lot of people right now looking at how do we take advantage of the PK of these drugs? How do we dose these drugs appropriately? So even the dosing of these drugs is a little bit still being looked at as far as what's the best way to dose these drugs again, because they're so old and didn't have a lot of good trials uh, used, used to support their approval, basically. <coughs> so that's, that's the bitter end of antimicrobials 101. Mm. So any questions, or I'm sure there's lots of questions, but any immediate questions. Um, I've had some people ask me about tips on studying these drugs. Um, I think, again, knowing sort of the trends and exceptions, I think, would be one thing I would recommend. Um, I've, I've recommended that a few of you talk to the two P3s who are doing the supplemental instruction uh, sessions. Um, I think they may have some good uh, pointers as far as how they studied for these drugs. Are they doing those on Wednesday, by the way, still, or does anyone know when those sessions are being held? Is everyone aware of that program, by the way? Okay. Um, so I think knowing exceptions, knowing trends, um, we'll go through here in a second, key spectrum of activity as well. Um, I mean, unfortunately, I think when it comes to knowing the what treats what, there is unfortunately some element of memorization, unfortunately, which comes into play. I think, you know, you probably noticed that I tend to kind of gloss over the PK slides to a certain degree, because I think, you know, clinically speaking, who cares if a drug is hepatic, you know, renal, and what percentage of each, um, except in those situations where you really have to worry about that. So things like aminoglycosides and vancomycin with having to be careful about uh, accumulation in patients who have renal dysfunction. Um, I'm not going to ask you a question that says, which of the following agents is available only in a PO formulation? So I'm not going to get down to that level of detail, I don't think. I provide the IBPO, et cetera, formulations just to kind of give you the context of where these drugs are available. Um, you know, knowing big major side effects, um, knowing big major adverse effects and how to deal with those, and so knowing how you handle a patient who's on linazolid and, and they're on an SSRI at the same time. So that may not be helpful, but those are some off-the-cuff ideas, I think. So should we continue with key spectrum of activity and then we'll wrap this up? Mm -hmm. So um, these are our lists of drugs that I would recommend that you know. So I asked you, what are the drugs that cover true anaerobes? Again, Bacteroides fragilis being the most important of the true anaerobes. What agents cover those? So remember, if you add a beta-lactamase inhibitor to a beta-lactam, then you automatically give that beta-lactam added anaerobic coverage. And so you have your, your four combinations of a penicillin plus a beta-lactamase inhibitor. I guess we actually now do have that new cephalosporin beta-lactamase inhibitor, but we'll pretend that doesn't exist for, for our purposes right now. Um, so again, adding sulbactam to ampicillin gives ampicillin, or gives that combination anaerobic coverage that ampicillin didn't have before you, you 
added till back to. Remember from the cephalosporin's point of view, you have the two uh, second generation agents, cefoxitin and cefotetin, so the cefamycins, which we use commonly for their anaerobic coverage. All the carbapenems have reliable anaerobic coverage. From a quinolone point of view, moxifloxacin would be the only that would have uh, coverage of Bacteroides fragilis. Um, metronidazole and clindamycin, but again, metronidazole being much more reliable from the standpoint of, again, emerging resistance to clindamycin. And then finally, tigacycline. And then what drugs cover pseudomonas? A very important <coughs> one to know. And so, Again, from a penicillin's point of view, um, while piperacillin and ticarcillin by themselves do cover pseudomonas, those drugs don't exist right now in their, by themselves, so they only exist in that combination format. And so piptazo and ticarcillin clavulanic acid would be the two penicillins with coverage against um, pseudomonas. Remember your two cephalosporins, ceftazidine versus cefepime. Um, from a hospital point of view, if you were going to decide that you wanted one any pseudomonal cephalosporin of the two of those, which would you choose as your preferred cephalosporin? Cephapine, right? So remember, don't pay a dime for ceftazidime. Um, <clears throat> from a carbapenem point of view, doripenem, miropenem, imipenem, importantly, erdopenem is the only one that lacks coverage of pseudomonas. Remember, as trinam, that agent that we use for its gram negative coverage only, um, aminoglycosides, amicacin, tobramycin, genomycin all provide coverage. Fluoroquinolones, Cipro, and Levo only, and then Colistin and Polymixin B. So um, just one, also a tip from an exam point of view. So if I said to you on an exam, name 10 agents that cover pseudomonas, and you wrote fluoroquinolones, do you think that's completely true or maybe not quite completely true? Not quite. So that would not really, you'd probably get partial credit, but um, that would be saying that Levo, or rather that Moxie and Jemmy have pseudomonal coverage, which is not accurate. And so I'd be careful when it comes to that, and I think really you're probably better served for the most part by using individual drugs as opposed to drug classes, because you never know, drug classes often have those exceptions. So also if you said carbapenem, that wouldn't be entirely accurate either, because erbapenem lacks coverage. Um, and I think also, if I were to ask you a question like name 10 drugs that cover pseudomonas, another benefit of using individual drugs is that if you put your three carbapenems, you've crossed three off the list of 10, basically, right? So it also helps you in that way. So I think I would say it's always better to go with, if I'm not specifying, to go with individual drugs as opposed to classes of drugs. And then MRSA. So remember, we have our one um, beta-lactam, cefteroline, the, cep the cephalosporin, that advanced generation or fifth generation cephalosporin, which is the only drug that has activity against PBP2A, and so the only drug with activity against MRSA, or the only beta-lactam, rather. Um, I'll go down briefly to the bottom of the page. So vancomycin and all of its related drugs also has very good coverage of MRSA. Daptomycin, another, another drug that has very good coverage against MRSA. And then finally, our two oxazolidinones as well. And so in the middle there, with Clinda, with your tetracyclines, and with TMP-SMX, just be aware of the fact that those um, definitely have better activity against those community-associated strains. And for instance, um, doxycycline really wouldn't have a major role or a role really at all in someone who had a hospital-acquired MRSA strain. But for someone with a community-acquired MRSA skin infection, for instance, doxycycline becomes uh, a good drug. Tigacycline is kind of on the end there. Tigacycline would have activity against either community-associated or hospital-acquired. Tigacycline doesn't really care about um, community-acquired versus hospital-acquired. That is it. You've survived Antibiotics 101. So any questions, concerns? Okay, so the slides are posted for tomorrow, so we'll talk about sort of a little bit more about MIC testing and how we interpret MICs. Uh, we'll also talk about sort of principles of appropriate use of antibiotics, and then we'll talk a little bit about PKPD and how we use that to dose certain drugs. <laughs>